As you know, I don't go through any great detail in introducing our speakers because it's on the notes that you have. But obviously, when, whenever we bring in Andre, we're pleased because we know we're going to get some uh, original comment and some valuable comment. And uh, then today, we've brought the U.S. equivalent. <laughs> is, that a, is that a compliment, do you think? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, incomparable. Okay, that's good. Well, um, I don't know, uh, Trudy, were you going to start or was Andre going to start? I'm going to start. So it's ladies first. And why don't you share with me for a moment what's the process? You're going to talk for a few minutes? Yeah. Then, Andre, are you going to talk for a few minutes? And then we'll go straight to the audience. Yeah. Right. And you're mic'd, and we're ready to go. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I um, have been asked a lot on this trip about what really is Obamacare. And finding that many of the Canadian audiences are as confused about what it does and what it doesn't do as American audiences are. So I'm going to give a brief overview about Obamacare and what it does. And Andre is going to talk a lot about uh, both of us see that there are areas of convergence between the two systems. And that might seem very surprising given the fact that Canadians think Americans are dying on the streets. And Americans definitely think Canadians are dying on the streets. <laughs> because um, each country's healthcare system is so bad. So uh, what exactly is the Affordable Care Act? For one thing, it is not socialized medicine, it is not national health insurance, and it does not provide health insurance to every single American. It does not affect 160 million people who already get insurance through their employers. We have a very strongly entrenched employer-based system in the US, and that will continue for the foreseeable future. What Obamacare does is affect what we call the individual market. In the US, we've had th uh, three segments of our commercial marketplace, large group, small group, and the individual market. And in the individual market is where people have gone when they don't have coverage from their employer or Medicare or Medicaid, which are the big public systems. So uh, this market has been pretty perilous, I, I've always said. Um, it's very, very expensive because you're dealing with a risk pool of one person, not a zillion people to spread the risk of illness uh, and the cost of care for those who do get sick. And in our marketplace, up until Jan this coming January, people with pre-existing conditions could not get coverage for the very conditions they needed health care and health insurance for, which is a uh, kind of a crazy perversity in the American system. So what that meant in practice is that if someone had a disease, say asthma, the insurance company may or may not cover that person. But if it did, it would write her out or waiver out any care for asthma or perhaps even uh, any care for any lung disease, or even broader, any care for any disease of the respiratory system. So you see that people were kind of annoyed at this. And this, uh, this was sort of the rationale for the health reform in the US to reform the individual market. And people had sort of said, enough is enough. And I began writing about this perversity 20 years ago for Consumer Reports. And that was the first time anyone had really dealt with it in the media. So you can tell it's taken 20 years for us to get to the point of correcting this. So that at its, its core is Obamacare. There will be about 25 million people now shopping in this individual market. About 16, 15, 16 million of them had care, had coverage in this market before the law passed. And the rest of them will be newly uh, insured folks who are coming into the market. And as an inducement to get them to buy, because remember, we have to have a very large risk pool to make this work. In Canada, you have a very large risk pool because everyone's covered. And in the European systems, it works the same way, but not in the US. So as an enticement, we're offering subsidies, uh, taxpayer, it's an advanced tax credit, uh, to people uh, at the low end of the income spectrum to get them to come into the market and buy what are very, very expensive insurance policies. And to give you an idea of how expensive it is, uh, the average premium this year in the employer market is 16300 and some dollars for a good insurance policy. So these people need a lot of help. So about 40% of that, of the individual market, though, will not have subsidies. And there's a lot of worry about whether 
whether those people will have sufficient inducement to come into the market and buy. There will be penalties for not buying. Uh, the penalties are very low at this point. They do get somewhat higher as the years go on, and it's a big unknown whether people will just take the penalty because it's cheaper than paying 16 grand out of pocket that you don't have. Um, there's a lot of worry, particularly if um, the uh, whether middle-income people in the U.S. the median is around 51, 52 thousand dollars, whether those people will find the subsidy sufficient to buy a policy. Um, it, they may not because their subsidy may only be six, seven, eight thousand dollars, and if they buy a good policy, that they're still going to have to pay half the premium. Um, the expansion was also supposed to include the very poorest, and the law contemplated that the states would expand their Medicaid programs. And Medicaid is our health care, it's a joint federal state program for the poor. And the middle class also accesses Medicaid through uh, long-term care. It's the only way we really can pay for long-term care in the U.S. But in order to access long-term care benefits, a family has to spend all their assets and income on care first, and then Medicaid comes in. Afterwards, they sell the house and recover their money. The state does, that is. So what happened? This expansion, I think, the lack of this expansion now, uh, is going to be the Achilles heel of Obamacare. Um, last year, the US Supreme Court said the states had the option of not expanding their Medicaid programs. And 26 or 27 states have decided not to do it. They're primarily states in the South and in the conservative Midwest, uh, run largely by Republican governors with very Republican state legislators, and they have decided for various reasons they don't want to participate. What this means is that there will be five, six, seven, eight million people who will not be eligible to shop in the exchanges because they are too poor to get subsidies. They can uh, go to the exchanges, I guess, but they're not going to be eligible for subsidies, so they're not going to be able to afford the premiums. And I like to tell this little um, anecdote that the New York Times published a week or so ago about a woman in Virginia. She was a healthcare worker who had lost her job in Virginia, um, in Maryland, sorry, and had moved to Virginia to move in with a relative because she couldn't afford housing. And she was a healthcare worker, and she was, um, telling the Times reporter rather tearfully that how can somebody in poverty not be eligible for a subsidy? Because most of the times with our means-tested programs, you have to be, uh, you can't get them if you're over the line, not under the line. So this has been somewhat difficult for reporters to explain, uh, and there hasn't been a lot of press coverage yet, but it's beginning to pick up. Um, a couple other main points here. Um, we don't have a very equitable health care system. We really don't believe too much in equity. Um, and the Affordable Care Act bakes in what is already a lot of inequality in the U.S. health care system. And it's done in the following way, that uh, people who shop in these exchanges can have a choice, we like choice a lot, four tiers of insurance coverage. The cheapest coverage, which is what most people will buy, is the bronze plan, and it's designed to cover 60% of anyone's medical expenses. The silver plan covers 70, the gold plan 80, and the platinum plan 90, which is obviously the best plan. And it's turning out that many of the state exchanges are not going to have platinum policies because they're too expensive and they don't think people are going to buy them. And perhaps that's a good business decision on the part of the insurance companies. Um, the uh, ways that people will achieve, that the insurance companies will achieve this actuarial value of 60, 70, or 80 percent is through uh, out-of-pocket spending by the patient. And this is done now in the form of deductibles. We're having very, very high deductibles on insurance policies, somewhere in the range of four, five, six, ten thousand dollars even. I've seen some deductibles as high as twenty thousand dollars for out of network services. Then there's the issue of co-payments versus co-insurance. Uh, Americans confuse these constantly. A co-payment is a set amount for a service. It's ho historically been very, very low, five, ten dollars for a doctor, or forty to see a specialist. People say, I can afford that. But no, no, that's not the case anymore. The insurance companies and the employers 
It's also true of the employer market, are shifting people from a copayment to coinsurance. And coinsurance is a percentage of a bill that you have to pay. And obviously, it's much higher than a copayment. And it's going to really hit people in their pocketbooks if they get sick. And I've seen some policies where they're calling for copayment or coinsurance of 50% on the most used services. Guess what they are? Diagnostic imaging outpatient hospital care, outpatient procedures, and um, urgent care. A lot of people use urgent care centers so they're, and emergency rooms, so they're going to be asked to pay a lot for this. So I think there's kind of a perversity in this whole outpatient business because uh, we moved a lot of care out of inpatient services as a cost-cutting move. Uh, we began that in the 90s. And it was quite successful, I think. There was a cost reduction, although now the hospitals have figured out how to make outpatient services pretty expensive, too, to increase their uh, bottom lines. But uh, what the insurance companies are doing now is making people pay out of pocket for what are going to be the most commonly used services. And I think that has not really sunk in yet um, to the American public, either on the employer side, which is the rest of us, uh, and the people who are shopping in the exchanges. Do we have any cost containment built into this bill? Uh, I would say not. Uh, we have no um, negotiations um, called for to push back against the power of the hospitals and doctors. And uh, as you know, uh, they're pretty powerful groups in your country as well as in the US. And um, what we're trying to do is have something called accountable care organizations in medical homes. Not quite sure how to describe what a medical home is. Was it the county doctor that we had in uh, Scottsbluff, Nebraska when I was growing up? That was a medical home, I guess. People don't have that anymore. Um, when you ask people what these ACOs are, uh, they're not quite sure how to explain it and why it's different from the managed care experiments that we had in the 1990s. They're not experiments anymore. That's sort of the norm in the United States. Um, but the promise is that if they work, <clears throat> there will be cost savings, and the evidence right now is mixed on that. Uh, there will be cost savings, and people who will get more coordinated care, particularly the elderly, and you don't have so many mistakes in the handoff with the meds and all that, it will be a much more um, efficient system. And so that's sort of the promise. We don't really know whether that's going to work. Um, people are always asking me, um, is Obamacare going to work? And my answer is, I really don't know. I think it's going to take two, maybe three insurance cycles bef before we really know what insurance companies are doing with premiums. And the mantra for Obamacare has been in the whole sales job that um, you're going to get affordable quality health care. And most people are probably going to get neither uh, because it doesn't really designed to do that. Some young people are going to get cheap insurance premiums in the exchange, the 27-year-old non-smoker, because the uh, insurers want to get them into the risk pool to balance the sick people who inevitably will come in. But whether they'll raise those prices down the road, we don't know. Um, I do want to say one thing about uh, a backlash, because you've heard a lot about it with our recent government shutdown, and the ostensible reason was Obamacare. Um, my feeling is that a lot of that backlash could have been prevented had the media and the administration and others who were advocates in selling this particular brand of health reform had done a better job, and I'm going to talk about a few threads that I found was, were missing and are still missing in our debate. One of them is that nobody really, there was not a sustained discussion about what this law would do, who it would affect, and who it would not affect. The individual mandate and why people had to be penalized for not buying insurance was never really made clear. And I think the administration and others deliberately did not want to do that because they knew there would be a backlash that might deter the law from passage. And perhaps that was a correct political calculation. But I think that's come home to be part of the backlash. And what that's meant is that instead of describing to people why that was necessary, and it was necessary because 
we can't have an employer mandate because the employers really don't want it. They want to provide services and health care when they want it, but not all of them want to do that, and they don't want to be forced to do it. And we can't have a government mandate because it's like Canada and England, and we can't have socialized medicine. So when you take away those two options, what's left? The individual mandate. The other thing that I think, uh, two other points that were not made very clearly, one of them is basically this is a Republican plan. All these ideas, the, the mandate, the tax subsidies, the penalties, uh, were uh, advanced by Republicans in the early 90s to thwart the Clinton plan, which was more of an employer mandate approach with managed competition. And the um, uh, people didn't really like that approach either, so they came up with this. And that this, um, these ideas had been in the academic literature also since the early 90s. So when this backlash came from Tea Party Republicans and other Republicans, and really starting during in 09 when the law was being attacked, uh, passed, nobody ever came up to say this is really a, a Republican plan. Let's connect the dots here. Why, why is this going on? And ask the questions. And so um, I think for those reasons, we have had this um, backlash going on. And if these threads had been connected a little better by the press, I think maybe we wouldn't be seeing what we're seeing. And going forward, I suspect we're going to have a lot more of that. And I hope my colleagues in the media will um, kind of understand all this and make things a bit clearer to the US, because most Americans are really confused about what it does and doesn't do. Okay. okay, thanks, Trudy. Uh, it was great. I've got to hear Trudy's talk a few times. It gets better every time. So I'm <laughs> looking forward to her next Cross Canada tour, even better. So I'm not going to do a little lecture about Medicare because I think this audience probably knows Medicare fairly well, at least better than most Canadians. So I was going to talk a bit about the uh, common challenges that we have in Canada and the U.S. But first, I just want to say a couple of words about Obamacare, because I can't resist. Uh, you know, from the perspective of the Canadian, we see this as this fierce political battle going on in the US. And it seems to be a battle to, the, you know, to have the right to deny care to the poor. You know, it seems like quite an absurd thing, but that's from, from our perspective. You know, in Canada, we, we laugh at this, that, you know, oh, look at those nasty Americans. But I think in many ways, we're doing the same thing, but we're doing it without debate. So, you know, we're have a lot of things going on that are denying care to the poor, dumping more burden on the middle class, uh, you know, throwing people in prison, cutting our welfare rates, but we're just not discussing it. So I, I think we shouldn't be too, too self-righteous. Uh, the other thing is, on, on the convergence issue, is uh, we do have a lot more disparities coming in Canada, and we, we just don't talk about them. The disparities between provinces are greater every day. Uh, because here we don't have a discussion about an Affordable Care Act. We don't have one. We have a Canada Health Act, which is a paper tiger because it's not enforced in any way, shape, or form. So again, I, I think we have to be careful about our, our self-righteousness. Uh, we are seeing a lot of delisting of services, uh, gently moving people to private insurance. Private insurance is tightening up, rolling back. So many of the, the challenges that are taking place in the U.S., financial ones, we have in Canada. Uh, and we shouldn't forget it. But again, we, we do it without any discussion. Uh, and let's not forget that our private spending here is growing at about two to three times the rate of public spending. So there is a convergence. Uh, public spending in the US accounts for about 46% of their health care. In Canada, it's 70%. It's a, still a change, but it's not 100. You know, it's not zero on one side and 100 on the other, as we, we tend to see as Canadians. So that's my, my little rant about uh, Canada-US uh, differences. Uh, what I want to talk about now is our, our common challenges. And I'm uh, going to try and take 10 minutes and do 10 quick, quickly. Uh, so I think the big one is uh, just this philosophy of moving care to the community. Uh, this is a, a big discussion in both countries. Essentially, we need to take our, uh, we have these really hospital-based models, and we need to turn them on their head and make them community-based models. That, that's what patient-centered care is all about in a nutshell, getting people out of institutions largely, not entirely, and into the community. So we have ch common challenges. Uh, uh, how, how are we going to meet this demand for home care, for nursing home care, and how are we going to pay for it? Uh, we, don't have a, we don't have a plan for nursing home care in Canada, not any more than the US. They kind of, as Trudy said, do it de facto by Medicaid. We do it a little de facto by Medicare, but it's not an organized plan in any way. 
So this is, I think, what probably our, our number one uh, common challenge. And linked to that is primary care. We talk uh, more and more about the need for better primary care, uh, having a medical home, as Trudy said. Uh, what does a medical home mean? Uh, the uh, College of uh, Family Physicians of Canada has put out a whole, a really great document about this. What it is, is a central coordinating point. It can be a family doctor, it could be a community clinic, it could be a nurse practitioner, but it's a central coordination point for all your care uh, so that you have this uh, journey of care, if you will, that you don't get lost. We know that uh, in every country, and Canada included, that all the bad things happen in transitions. All our medical errors, uh, people getting forgotten, extra costs, uh, repetition of services all happens because of a lack of coordination. So that, that's the big challenge on the, on the practical level is who's going to coordinate the care. Uh, you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be a family doctor, but there has to be somebody to, to guide us through because of the complexity of care. Uh, and essentially we have to move from an episodic uh, chronic care model, which is what, how we created our system in the 1950s, to a more chronic care model. So people today have chronic illnesses more than, than acute ones. Um, drugs. Uh, drugs is a big challenge in both of our countries, uh, the, the costs, how to pay for them. Uh, in Canada, it's the big missing piece, one of the big missing pieces of Medicare. Uh, our, as you know, our Medicare system covers physician hospital care 100%, with a small asterisk there on the 100%. Uh, but drugs is all over the place. Uh, only about 45% uh, of drugs are covered by, by public plans. So it's mostly a private system in Canada. And again, the private plans are, are tightening up. Uh, to me, this is, uh, we have about 600,000 Canadians with no drug insurance whatsoever, uh, about five to six million with inadequate coverage. That's the great hole in Medicare. So we, we've got to fix that one uh, and quickly. And, you know, let's for, not forget we have 22 million people in Canada with private drug insurance. We do have a lot of private insurance in this country. Um, social determinants is an issue that's uh, being discussed in, in both countries uh, a lot more. Not by the Tea Party, of course, but, you know, this notion that healthcare is not just about med medicine. Uh, never has been, but we're sort of recognizing it now that we have to invest more in education, in housing, et cetera, things that, you know, the causes of the causes of bad health, if you will. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting discussion, not a lot of practical stuff going on, but a lot of discussion going on. And I think uh, there's recognition too, even at uh, papers like mine that are fairly right wing at the globe, that this notion that inequality is really having an impact on not only on the economy, but on the health of people. And I think inequality is going to be one of our, our big discussions. I know at the Globe we're doing a big series on this uh, coming up, and I'm doing some pieces about the uh, effect of inequality on health of Canadians, both individual and, and collectively. Uh, quality is a big issue. We both know that uh, in both countries, uh, medical errors or adverse events, if you like the euphemism, uh, are one of the leading causes of death, about the third or fourth leading cause of death in both countries, but kill about 24,000 people a year in Canada, so we have to address that. Uh, you know, I'm often asked the question, what, what do people want from a healthcare system? What do they want from Medicare? And I think the answer is fairly straightforward. They want safe, prompt, effective, affordable care. And we can't, uh, you know, forget the quality part of that, the, the safe part and make those that are our guiding principles. Um, I can't talk about healthcare in either of our countries without talking about rationing. Uh, the US rations with economics by making care unaffordable for, for many. Uh, was 51 million, it's gonna be maybe 25 or 30 million when all this battle is said and done, but a lot of people will be left out. Uh, in Canada, we ration a little differently. We ration by withholding services, by having wait lists, denying uh, certain kinds of care. But the reality is we, we're all going to ration. We have to find the best way to do it. I, I think the best way to do it is ration based on what works and based on quality. And the economics will generally work themselves out, hopefully. Uh, we both have an issue in, our, our in both of our countries with uh, uh, frequent flyers, for lack of a better term. I know some people don't like that terminology, but you know the patients who, who use a lot of care. So 1% of patients consume approximately 25% of medical care, and that's true in Canada as in the US, and 5% consume 50%. So fully half of our budgets go to 5% of people. 
And they're not bad people, they're not evil people, uh, they're people with, with health issues. But the, the response has to be, you know, if we can deal with that, those really difficult patients, then we will we'll control our costs overall because they're the real cost drivers. And, you know, we just have to be a little more innovative and a little smarter on how we cover them. Uh, Trudy's heard this story a couple of times because I like to tell it, but uh, I, I like to give the, an anecdote of a person I wrote about in Hamilton. So he had visited the uh, emergency room at his local hospital 238 times in a year. It's well known by name, everybody knew him. Uh, somebody decided to do a little study on this guy. His cost, uh, the cost of his care, we're not very good at costing care in Canada, but roughly costs the hospital about $1.5 million to care for each year. He had a whole bunch of problems, everything in alphabet soup of problems, addiction, uh, homelessness, uh, foot problems, cardiac problems, mental health, you name it, this guy had it. So, but what do you do with him? Uh, you know, do you want him going in this rotating uh, door of the, the emergency every, essentially every day? I guess he took weekends off, I'm not sure. Uh, so what did they do? They decided to do something innovative. They assigned him a nurse, a full-time nurse. Her salary was about $60,000. Uh, here's her number. Here's some quarters for the payphone. Call her whenever you want, day or night. So what happened? Well, I, I, she had an interesting job, for one thing. Uh, uh, she did things that uh, nurses don't always do, but that were really good for his health, like find him an apartment. Uh, really practical things, uh, find him a place to, to get food into him occasionally, all the services in the community, so a little guiding light. Uh, and the next year, his emergency room visits were down to about 60, a dramatic, about a million dollar saving for this investment. So it's just an example of, eh, you know, why don't we do this kind of stuff? We know it works. Well, why don't we do it? It's because a bunch, you know, when this story's written, a bunch of people complain, why does he get a nurse and I don't? He's a bum. But you know we have to go a, a little beyond the, the self-serving stuff and, and look at the practical effects. And I, I tend to be fairly pragmatic in the stuff. Uh, Public-private mix, I talked to be a bit about at the, 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 uh, the outset. I won't uh, talk too much about it, but it's essentially a false dichotomy of a debate. The reality is we have private care, we have public care in every country in the world that has universal health care, which is about 50. And the question is, what, what's the proper mix for us, for our culture, for our system? Right now it's 70-30, public-private. Uh, in most European countries, it's 80-20. So they have more public spending, but more private delivery. So which way should we go? Uh, I, I don't think there's a, a set answer, but I think we have to discuss it more than in the black and white, private bad, public good. It's not that, that simple. Um, skip that one. Uh, and the last thing is, you know, we both have this terminology. Uh, T Trudy has talked about it, I've talked about it. We need to have an adult conversation about all this stuff. So hopefully that's what we're having today, an adult conversation. But the real challenge is, what's the forum for it? Uh, there's so much uh, political extremism and rhetoric. Uh, we see it in the US, but we have just as much of it in Canada. You just have to look at the throne speech and the response. A lot of uh, more and more extremism, less uh, sensible debate. So. How are we going to have the discussion is, is the, the last thing I'll leave you to, th to mull over. And we decided to keep this short so that we give most of the time for you guys to ask questions. And, have to, and Trudy's going to get in a couple of more two cents and then uh, come up to the mics and fire away. Um, I just want to amplify uh, the point Andre made about long-term care and community care because um, I keep hearing this in my travels across Canada that this seems to be a real issue in terms of the wait lists and uh, there's got to be, it's not good for the patients, there's got to be, you know, like this guy, he, he needs other solutions. So I think it's interesting to look at what's happened in the U.S. that might be of use as you consider what to do about long-term care in your country. The Affordable Care Act did call for a beginning way to pre-fund long-term care in the U.S. It was called the CLASS Act. And it stands for community living something something and it was championed by Ted Kennedy and I think that it got into the law partly because he was dying and they, he was always a champion of health reform and they wanted to do something for Ted Kennedy. It was not popular when it went into the law particularly by the uh, conservative states and the Republicans and the Tea Party crowd 
And many other people thought that it probably wouldn't work because it was a voluntary program and people would pay a little bit into this federal system and then when they got old and needed uh, community-based care, they would be able to tap this fund and pay for it. I think some of it was also uh, they could access it for uh, facility care as well. Um, this uh, was repealed not uh, too many uh, months or years after the ACA was passed because it really wasn't going to work. And the Secretary of Health and Human Services finally threw in the towel. They had hired a bunch of actuaries and realized that because it was a voluntary program, the risk pool would never be large enough to really make it work. So that was the only thing that we had on the horizons to begin to pay for any of this. Since it has vanished from the ACA, there has been virtually no discussion of long-term care. And we do have a good law in place to provide home and community-based services. It's called the Older Americans Act. This law goes back to the Johnson years in the mid-60s. Um, the meals programs for seniors were added during Nixon's term in the early 70s. Um, there, it's a great law. There it provides uh, all the home transportation, counseling, all the services you would want to keep an elder at home. Unfortunately, it has not been funded adequately for the last uh, two or three decades. And the funding for these programs have been flatlined. And so the result is that there are long, long waiting lists for services in almost every jurisdiction. And I recently did a piece for The Nation magazine on uh, hunger among the elderly. And we have people in various areas waiting months for a hot meal delivered by Meals on Wheels under the um, Older Americans Act programs. And people are saying, well, maybe they can pay pri privately. Well, most of these people cannot afford to pay privately even the two or three dollars a day that they would have to pay to get one hot meal delivered. And uh, I interviewed a family in Baltimore, uh, which kind of illustrates in some ways similarities between our two systems. Uh, one man was number 13,146 on a waiting list for a Medicaid waiver that would give him community supports and maintain him in the home. He's headed to a nursing home pretty quickly because he's never going to get them. And then I interviewed a very old couple in Baltimore County and the man was 80 or 90 and the wife was 91, so a year later and figure how old they are. Both of them uh, were getting meals when I had come a year ago to visit them. One meal had been dropped because they couldn't afford it. After several minutes of the interview, he confided to me they really couldn't afford it. So this summer, the social worker called them back as I was updating my research uh, for the publication. And he said that he had to drop his meal too because they couldn't afford it. And she asked him how they were managing. And he said, we do the best we can but some days the best isn't good enough. And I think that kind of describes where we are with long-term care. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you, Andre. Um, actually, this is as good a demonstration, I think, as we'll ever get about why journalists are important. Simplifying it, bringing it down to where we understand it, because uh, it is a complex topic, the most complex topic, I think, that's covered certainly in the, in the public press. So we do have Q&As, and um, I occasionally watch the medical meetings uh, that occur on television, and I notice that doctors don't ask questions. They get up there and they hold speeches. So any doctors in the audience, this is not a medical meeting, just to let you know. So we'll take Q&As, and we have a microphone here, and I'm roaming with this one. Who'd like to start? Boy, that's it. We're ready. We're done. Now we're very thorough. <laughs> You're afraid of it. Here we go, Dr. Wright. Thank you. That, that was quite enlightening, actually, for me, uh, Trudy, particularly as I'm very familiar with the Canadian system. Um, you used the word rationing, which is a highly allergenic word, <laughs> as you know, and. Uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a feeling which I share and which is being widely published now that if we could capture only a portion of the unnecessary care that's being given, of the overdiagnosis issue, of the repetitive unnecessary testing, uh, if we could even recapture a portion of that, then 
some form of rationing may always be necessary, but at least uh, we could get on with a much more sustainable system without using the R word. Yeah, so in both of our countries, the research shows over and over again that 20, about 25 to 30 percent of care is over treatment, so unnecessary, not useful, however you want to word it. So that, that's a lot of money. In Canada, that's $60 billion a year. Uh, when I talked about rationing, that, that's what I said. That, you know, we're always going to ration. That's how we should ration, according to me, is ration based on what works and what's cost effective. Uh, you, you know, it's a evidence-based rationing, if you will. I know that's not popular in some political circles these days, but you know, that, that's probably the, the best way to do it. And, and we don't do it for a whole host of reasons. It doesn't always suit everyone's agenda. Well, we've been talking about this for 20 years, and I don't see any change. I mean, we have, uh, to use Mark Sasson's rubric of overuse, underuse, and misuse in the, in the healthcare system, uh, lately we've talked a lot about overuse and too much treatment, and to the exclusion of talking about the underuse and the people that I've just described. And so I think we really, we're talking about it, but I don't think we've gotten very far because there are very, powerful interests um, who like to do extra tests. And I think that is really hard to deal with. But there's the, the Choosing Wisely campaign is really interesting in the US and it's coming to Canada. This, you know, getting the professional groups who are the vested mm. interests to say, yeah. you know, put the onus on them. Listen, what are you doing that you shouldn't be doing? And they know what it is, but make them articulate it and hopefully act on it. So that, that's, I think, a really positive yeah. initiative. And representing the patient, Shalom Gloverman. I, I think that one of the things that became clear after you started to look at all the overuse stuff in the States and the overuse stuff in Canada is that doctors' culture is to use all resources that are available to help the patient. That's, that's a proper thing to do. The thing is that the resources that are available are hospitals and drugs and hospital services. We don't have services in the community. We don't have services that will help people with chronic care. We don't partner with patients on chronic care, which you have to do, and everybody knows that. So the whole structure of the system is we have bloated hospital care, bloated medical care, very little community services, almost none. Uh, the amount of money spent on community services here is a fraction of what it's spent on in Britain. People's houses aren't fitted for them to live in so that they can live when they get old. We don't, we don't pay for that, we don't provide it. In order to get it, you have to go to very high specialty companies. The same is true in the States. Insurance doesn't cover community services, it covers hospitals and medical care, in, both in Canada and the States. So it doesn't cover the possibility of people living and continue to live in the community as they get older. And I don't think it's just a, uh, an odd fact that we have more chronic care, it's that we have a, an aging population and natural aging includes the beginning of chronic disease. As you get older, you start to get chronic diseases. That's what happens. That's how you grow older. And I think that we don't properly care for them. We don't deal with chronic diseases the way they're supposed to be dealt with because we deal with everything as if it's acute. In the United States, it's, it's all very highly specialized and very acute care focused. In Canada, the same is true. So our two countries are very, very similar. Patients aren't partners in their care, and the patient, Patients Canada is working very hard to make patients partners, not only in their care, but in the decisions about services and the decisions about how they're distributed and so on. And I think that that's, that's the work that we all have to do, is to start to build up, as you said, community services and to make sure that they're there and to make sure that they're covered, because they're not covered by insurance. And I, I think the point you make is an important one, that but I, I would put it in, frame it in a different way, that we, we don't have a problem with medical care in Canada. We have good medical care. We have administrative and engineering issues that we have to deal with, and we don't often frame them in that way. Uh, you know, we have a Medicare system that was created in the late 1950s. It was created for the demographics of the time, a young, healthy population with acute needs, having a whole bunch of babies. It was the baby boom. Today, we have a different demographic entirely, much older, uh, chronic illness is not acute, uh, but we, we haven't adjusted the, the system administratively or, or engineered it for, for our demographics, and that, that's what has to happen. Ray Zadeber back here. Thank you very much. I was wondering, in terms of the Supreme Court decision that is about to come down today, and the question about who gets to define 
when care is futile and what is necessary, and whether or not uh, you're sort of entitled to multi-million dollars worth of care for no purpose, whether that is going to change the system and whether one possibility is to become a little more American and say uh, publicly insured medically necessary care is only what clinicians find appropriate and there is a op market opportunity to somebody to set up a private clinic to do um, you know, sort of intensive care for people who will not recover at a cost of, and I guess a U.S. market opportunity for that. What do you think is likely to happen as a result of the Supreme Court decision which would say physicians can no longer decide what's appropriate if that's what they decide? I'll tell you in <laughs> one hour and 15 minutes, I'll tell you the exact answer to that question. But I've uh, taken the mic away from raising. Okay. <laughs> but I, you know, I think it'd be, I, I think, uh, first of all, I think it's unfortunate that these decisions have to be made by the courts, that we haven't had the political courage to make them. You know, it's just sort of an abdication of responsibility, I think. That's my opinion. Uh, now, what's going to happen practically? I, I don't know what the court will decide. I think it'll probably be a fairly nuanced decision, if I had to guess. Uh, but I think what the larger question you're asking is, I, I think a debate we have to have is, what's going to be in the Medicare basket of services and what's going to be out? And you're a far greater expert on this than I, I will ever be, but that, that's a really tough issue. Uh, how do we ration public services is essentially the debate that we're, we don't have. And in Canada, we, we do this by just sidestepping the discussion. We kind of delist stuff occasionally, put stuff back in if there's a front page story in the Toronto Star. Uh, you know, it's done in this irrational basis. And it's getting more and more irrational because it's not the same in every province anymore. So, I think there has to be some kind of, not a master list of this is covered and this isn't, because that's not practical, but there has to be a process, uh, something like a NICE in the UK. Now that's not 100% ideal, but that kind of model saying, here's what works, uh, here's what we can afford in a public plan, so this is what we're going to cover. It's not going to be perfect, uh, there's still going to be the front page stories on the Toronto Star, but maybe there'll be a process that makes it easier for the politicians to, to implement rational measures. So. I, that's what I'd like to see. Will, will it happen? I, I'm not overly confident, because that's not how the, the political world operates. And I, I think, unfortunately, we're going more towards the US system, where the, the decisions are becoming more and more irrational, because they're just becoming populist and easy, and et cetera. Well, we had the Terry Schiavo decision um, in the mid-2000s. And that was a political football. And um, this young lady was on life support, I think her ex-husband or husband wanted to um, end it, family members did not, and this went all the way to the U.S. Congress. And um, the uh, U.S. Senate called a, an emergency meeting over Easter to pass a law uh, to favor keeping Ms. Shiro on life support, I think's what happened. And as a result of that, we really didn't have any discussion about end of life and when it's time. The only thing I can remember that happened after that is that Bill Frist, who was the Senate Majority Leader at the time, probably decided he wasn't going to run again because his decisions were quite unpopular. Uh, he was um, preaching that we've got to preserve the sanctity of life. And at the same time in Tennessee, the governor was cutting um, thousands of people off of TenCare, which was um, a very, very early version of Obamacare. And it allowed people who were um, disenfranchised um, insurance-wise uh, to get subsidies to buy coverage, and it allowed people in with pre-existing conditions. And that was um, underfunded and was very costly and had to be fixed. And Frist was in this position where he was supporting one thing and supporting another. So I think he was really the fallout from that one. Uh, Trudy, it's uh, John Abbott. Hi, and Andre. I was wondering if you can just for a second or so talk about how Obamacare was tying into the American deficit debt situation. <laughs> and Andre, if you sort of, if there's any parallels in Canada on how healthcare is driving expenditures and deficits and debt, see what the comparisons are. Thanks. Well, I don't think during this last go around we heard that Obamacare was going to break the bank. I think it was more of an ideological reason 
really unstated what's so bad about it, um, which really was not terribly well articulated by the people who wanted to repeal the law. And they knew right away that they didn't have much chance of doing it. And in my opinion, it was really a pretext to deal with other budget issues. Um, the other budget issues are going to deal with what we call entitlements, which is sort of a pejorative word to begin with. And uh, one of them is our Medicare program for the elderly. And it's been real quiet the last eight or nine months about Medicare, but it's not going to be going forward because uh, there's a big push uh, among Republicans and Democrats. Lots of Democrats support this. Um, basically, privatizing Medicare. Um, some elements like the drug benefit are already privatized. The benefit is provided by private insurers, but the rest of the program, with the exception of Medicare Advantage plans, is not. It's publicly provided coverage. And I think they want to try to deal with that problem and move people away from that. Uh, there's a move to means test it more than it is right now. Basically, it was not means tested. Everybody paid in the same premium, got the same basic benefits. That's been changing over the last few years. Again, supported by both parties, um, most people in both parties. They think it's fine that uh, richer elders have to pay more for their Medicare benefits. And there's some talk of defining what rich means, and that may mean in some legislative uh, proposals that families or individuals, I forget which it is, uh, with incomes around forty, forty-five thousand dollars will be considered rich and will be snared in this income-related premium. So that is kind of a concern for people who strongly support Medicare as social insurance. And the program has worked reasonably well uh, all these years and made it possible for people to get care. Without that program, they would not be getting any kind of care. Um, so I've heard that that's going to be an issue. I'm pretty sure that's going to be an issue. How far do we go? What do we do about Medicare? Again, most people are unaware of what's happening uh, with the program because they don't understand what it is in the first place. And the other issue uh, with entitlements is our Social Security program. And this has been under attack for at least two decades now by conservative interests that have wanted to privatize it. Privatizing Social Security is not really in the cards right now. But cutting the COLA, the cost of living uh, formula, is. And some people believe that uh, there could be a change in the cost of living formula to reduce the amount that the government needs to spend on Social Security. And doing that is going to hurt a lot of very low income people, particularly women, who live on the benefit, which the average benefit is about $1,100 a month. And you know that doesn't go very far. So uh, I think health care does have a lot to do with it. And in the long term, if you think about the deficit and the budget over several years, I think the subsidies under Obamacare will also come into play. Because right now, they're, so, they're uh, financed for a 10-year time frame. That's how the CBO does things. Um, but I'm not sure they're secure long term. I think they are for the next three, four, five years. But 10 years from now? You know, I don't know whether they're going to meet the same fate as Medicare may meet. I have a question Thank about. Oh, sorry. I've, I've got you in the lineup. That was a related question. Thank you very much for two uh, excellent presentations. Um, what I'm concerned about is uh, I think most people are enthusiastic, as I certainly am, for the concept of patient centered care. However, the evidence would be overwhelming that in North America, governments choose not to educate people about what's going on in the healthcare system and what it means for them. And, and simply, simply because of that, people don't know exactly what they're expecting or what they should expect. And I, I wanted to go to one of Andre's comments about people's expectations. And <clears throat> my own sad bias is until the internet and education and more and more information comes pouring through electronic and elsewhere, <clears throat> the public won't understand what patient-centered care really means and really demand the kind of quality care that they should be getting. And uh, I'll, I'll give a good example, which is expectation and need. Uh, I think the polling demonstrates very clearly that Canadians are waking up to the fact 
that access is a disaster except in extreme acute care cases where they're identified, where, which we handle quite well. But they, 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 are, they are very concerned and they see the international evidence from, uh, from the Commonwealth uh, studies and Commonwealth Trust studies and so on, that we are very badly served by access. So they're figuring that out and they're getting mad and as they, as they figure that out, they will begin to do more and more about it. Uh, and <clears throat> there are some positive uh, things happening on that front, like dealing with uh, virtual appointments and uh, things like that to change some of the uh, uh, some of the process. On the other hand, they haven't the faintest idea. They believe they get quality, so they're not really demanding quality because they believe they get it. And we all know that there are very serious problems in quality, and that to me is one of the great challenges is getting an appreciation of quality because that will substantially improve the system. Any comments? No? Then we're going to go to our last question. Katrina Fisher, you're with the ministry. Thank you. Hi, um, I have a question for Trudy and uh, I would like to, to uh, get a little bit better understanding of the hospital costs. I understand that the hospitals have price lists and that they charge the patients or um, negotiate the price list with the insurances. Um, <clears throat> and if you are patient charged, then you can negotiate on your own if you, if you know, know you can. Now in the Obamacare, you said that the, the Act does not have the negotiations power. So can you explain what you mean by that, please? Okay, in the ACA, there is nothing that compels government to negotiate with the doctors or hospitals over prices. Uh, there is some of that in the Medicare program. It hasn't worked terribly well because sometimes uh, CMS doesn't want to pay for something because the evidence isn't there and some specialty group will come along or some device manufacturer or drug company and they will lobby Congress and they will make sure that Medicare pays for whatever they want. So um, we have controlled the cost somewhat in that program, but not totally. So in the rest of the healthcare system, uh, the ACA doesn't do anything about that. Um, in looking at evidence, we have set up a group called PCORI, Patient Centered Outcomes Something Commission, and this group is supposed to look at the evidence for various procedures and make recommendations, but they are barred from considering cost. So Medicare, in other words, cannot use cost as an element in deciding whether to cover a service. Unlike in Britain where what NICE really does based on clinical and cost effectiveness, most doctors who practice in the NHS have been schooled in the NHS and they do what NICE wants them to do uh, most of the time. Uh, as far as the price lists, um, the hospitals have lists called, uh, those are the charges, and these are the retail prices for X services, and they are really high. And recent data uh, provided to us by CMS is showing wildly different uh, prices in the same community for the very same service. And you can go on the CMS website and find these, and you know, you'd be horrified to see those, those disparities. Um, but they're phony prices, really. The only people who have to pay them have been individuals who've had no, huh? And uh, yeah, people who have no third-party payer that operates in the United States paying their bills, and they can be really high. So what happens in practice is that the hospitals negotiate with the insurance companies and they bargain for something much less than what that list price is. So um, um, an appendectomy may be um, $10,000. I mean, I'm just making the number up. But in reality, Blue Cross is not gonna pay $10,000 for an appendectomy. It will pay maybe $4,000 for an appendectomy. So um, right now, I think what's happening, I think this is probably worthwhile to keep in mind, is that many of the hospital systems are growing larger and larger, and we're seeing a lot of conglomeratization going on in certain areas, certain cities. So you may have two gigantic hospital systems, or maybe three, 
um, all competing with each other. And the favorite way they do this is not by price, but are things like uh, who has the best imaging equipment that they just bought from GE and want to get you in to use that, or who has the best um, cardiac care. We do bariatric surgery better than the next one, that kind of thing. And they advertise on billboards, radio, and television. In New York, they become like the drug companies. You, you, at mealtime, you hear the drug ads, and then you hear the hospital ads or commercials. And so there's a fear that these big systems are going to have inordinate power to set the prices. And of course, they're going to negotiate with the big insurers because maybe that who will be left. We'll have five main insurance companies, and these little guys aren't going to be able to meet this uh, loss ratio test, so they're not going to have the data to price their policies. So you're going to have the big hospital systems competing with uh, United Healthcare, which is a behemoth, or WellPoint, another behemoth. So you have to wonder, where's the competition going to be, and how much that negotiation between these two really profit-oriented organizations, even the nonprofit hospitals have to make profits, are going to lower those prices. And I think that's a really big unknown. I was reading a great piece yesterday about uh, a journalist who looked at a, a $35 pap test and how it came to cost the patient $1,000, which is you know, sort of a typical story. Uh, I would recommend people read uh, Stephen Brill did this great oh, yes. piece in Time magazine, yes. like a 36-pager yeah. on the cost of care. Uh, I found that fascinating, but when I was reading that as a Canadian, I, what struck me is we uh, were totally ignorant. We're in the dark. So we kind of assume, yeah. oh, we're good socialists, we don't pay very much for stuff. <laughs> I, I don't think that's true. I think uh, we're, you know, ignorance is bliss, and uh, we probably you know, overpay for a lot of stuff as much as the U.S. does, and we're just uh, oblivious to it. Second right. highest consumers of uh, pharmaceuticals in the world. Yeah, among yeah. other things. Right. Yeah. And we have, you know, they have their uh, list price. We have set up a similar system for, for drugs in Canada. Uh, the manufacturers say they cost this much, and then yeah, the government negotiate. negotiates their secret contract, which we're not allowed to see because I don't want to protect the company. And, you know, so we have a lot of these uh, pretend things in Canada as well. And uh, what comes up over and over again, I'm surprised I didn't get a question here because almost every time I talk, I get the question is, why don't we do shadow billing? So why don't we send patients <laughs> a bill, you know, here's how much your care costs each year? Uh, and it's a, it's a really interesting question. They did it, uh, and my answer is always the same, is that it's not very political, pal politically palatable. They did it in Alberta for a couple of years. We did it in Quebec. Yeah, and Quebec did it for a bit. And in both cases, it was enormously unpopular because people got this thing and they said, oh, how dare you tell me how much I, you know, I pay my damn taxes. Like, people saw it as, a, you know, being called out and judged. So it's, it's interesting uh, culturally whether we can do that or not. There's a call for that, more transparency. Uh, as an old consumer reporter, always advocating, of course, more and more information, you know, I'm sort of doing um, uh, revisionist, <laughs> a revisionism on my own work and what I believed. And I'm really not sure that that is really going to be very effective. I think Americans will probably have the same um, uh, reaction to it as people in uh, other provinces have had. However, I will say one thing about Steve Brill's piece. I think it was the best piece of American health journalism this year. And it is very long, um, but it is worth reading. And we have had tons of, every time I've written about it, and I did a Q&A with him, um, there have been tons of hits. People want to know about it. And Steve told me that he has, uh, he's just been overwhelmed by uh, ordinary people uh, reacting, calling him. Um, and I think that that tells you a lot. Um, the piece that I did on uh, Brill's piece got, was cross-posted by a, a group called Op-Ed News. And this piece got, my piece, got about 12,000 hits. It was just an ordinary blog post. So if it got that many hits, I've never had that many hits on anything, um, you know that the interest in what he had to say is really there. And I think that's a good sign, because I think it means that Americans really are beginning to pay some attention, at least the cost. Well, Trudy and Andre, thank you for bringing some clarity to the audience today. This is very much appreciated. Am I right, audience? Mm -hmm.
I'm sure, Trudy, you'll get some additional Canadian readers after this morning. So we <laughs> thank you for coming down thank for you. this. On October 30th, the minister is going to have a similar session, a Q&A session uh, at Rotman. Look for it in your mailbox and uh, join us on October 30th. And I'd like to thank John again for sponsoring this, John. And your co-sponsor was Accenture, who sponsors each and every one of these sessions. Thank you for coming to breakfast with the Jeeves.